Good evening, and welcome back to another episode of Raven Investigates. Tonight, we will be traveling to the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and looking into a case that involves a young nurse that met the end of her life under very strange circumstances. From inconsistent reports of a body found in a barrel, to mysterious voicemails, this case is bound to make you look at the official reports and question every single official claim that was made by the investigative body. Tonight, we will be investigating the unsolved murder of Deborah Ann Wolf. Deborah Ann Wolf, known to her friends and family as Debbie, worked her day job as a nurse in the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina. She was known to be a very neat and meticulous person in her daily life, and preferred things to be tidy, organized, and in their place. In 1985, Debbie celebrated Christmas with her family like she always had. Nothing seemed to be off or strange about her behavior. The next day, December 26th, she went to work, worked throughout the day, and was seen leaving at 4 p.m., after which she seemingly vanished. On December 27th, Debbie failed to show up for work, which set off a number of alarms for her co-workers and her family. After being told that she hadn't made it in, Debbie's parents, Jenny and John, and her friend, Kevin Gorton, went to her home, which was a small cabin a few miles outside the city. Upon arriving, things immediately seemed wrong, starting with her car. Debbie's meticulous behavior was well known to them, so when they noticed that her car was parked in a different spot than normal, and the randomly scattered beer cans in the yard, they opted to continue investigating. Further on, they found that her dogs had not been fed, and that her uniform was on the kitchen floor, and her purse was shoved under her bed. Stranger still, there was a message on Debbie's answering machine from earlier that same day that stated that Debbie had been absent from work for several days. This made zero sense to them as she had been at work on the 26th, as stated by a number of people that knew her. The search continued. The group looked around the property, up to and including a pond that was in her backyard. Unfortunately, their search was fruitless. There was no sign of Debbie at all. With this information, they attempted to report her as a missing person, but the police, of course, refused to get involved until 72 hours had passed. Unfortunately, it was not until December 31st, a total of five days, or 120 hours, after her disappearance, that the police actually began their investigation. On the first day of the investigation, the police searched the area around her house and used bloodhounds in an attempt to catch a scent. They searched a majority of the property, minus the pond. The next day, January 1st of 1986, Jenny, Debbie's mother, had two divers, Kevin Gorton, the friend from earlier, and Gordon Childress searched the pond on the property. It didn't take long for Gordon to find a clue as to what may have happened. He found a set of footprints and drag marks at the bottom of the pond. Unfortunately, following this clue and continuing the search, they found Debbie's body in the pond. Adding a layer of confusion to this, when they found her body, it had been seemingly placed inside of a burn barrel. After finding the body, they contacted the police, who basically came, drained the pond, and got it from there. Then an autopsy was performed, and it was determined that there were no alcohol or drugs in her system, and that she had died by drowning. A finding that was refuted by Kevin Gorton, who was a member of Search and Rescue, due to the state in which her body was found. He stated that drowning victims are often found with their eyes and mouth wide open, and their arms and hands outstretched. On top of this, her body was also found to be relatively clean, in complete contrast to the dirtiness of the pond. 
this is where things take a turn for the worse and the stranger. It was officially stated by police investigators that Debbie had accidentally fallen into the pond while playing with her dogs, and that's how she died. Of course, her family and friends did not believe this claim, the strongest piece of evidence being that they found her body inside of a barrel. The investigators' response to this? There apparently was no barrel at all. They claimed that Kevin and Gordon did not see a barrel, but instead saw her jacket ballooned up from being in the water and simply thought that there was a barrel. This was, again, not accepted by the people involved. They said it was absolutely a barrel. In fact, it was stated by her family that they knew which barrel it was. There was a metal barrel that sat next to her home that was used for target practice. On the 27th, when the family went to investigate the property, Jenny said that she had noticed the barrel was missing, but the indentation on the ground was still there. A few months after Debbie's body was found, her mother was finally given a chance to examine the clothing that was found on her when the police brought the body in. Upon her examination, Jenny said the clothing that she was given did not belong to her daughter. The pants were too large, the jacket she was wearing did not belong to her, nor was it the one that she had borrowed from her brother. The bra that she was given had a cup size that was three sizes too large for her. The shoes were also three sizes too large. When Jenny tried to claim that the clothing did not belong to her daughter, she was met with a simple rebuttal by the investigators. Basically, yes they did. A final note on the officially reported information, Jenny, Debbie's mother, believes that her daughter was murdered by one of two volunteers at the hospital where Debbie worked. Apparently, both of these volunteers had attempted to pursue a romantic relationship with Debbie, and both knew where her house was. Jenny believed that Debbie was taken hostage, held for several days, and then killed and dumped in the pond. I would like to start this section off by saying that a lot of this information is sourced from the Godwin Trial and Forensics Consultancy Incorporated website, founded and owned by Dr. Maurice Godwin. The information on this page is in the sources document in the description, and this information is being used for research and reporting purposes under fair use. I wanted to mention this as I will be using this information to add to what I've already stated, and would like you all to consider taking a moment to read Godwin's absolutely fantastic write-up on this case, as they did a stellar job on this investigation. That said, first point of confusion to add to this whole situation, the police investigators claimed that the pond was not searched on that first day, because the captain of the sheriff's department stated that he believed the family had already searched the pond. I take major issue with this because it is the investigator's job and the police's job to search for the body, or to search for any clues, thus they should not have simply stopped because the family said they looked at the pond. That, in my opinion, is shoddy police work. Some information about Debbie's body when it was found that was not covered initially, she apparently had several abrasions on her fingers, a prime indicator of a struggle. On top of that, Drowning victims are usually found with a white and frothy substance in their airways, or extruding from their mouth or nostrils. This is typically the main indicator as to whether or not a person was alive when they entered the water. Debbie's body had no indication of the frothy substance in her airways or on her mouth, and there was a minimal amount of water found in her bronchial tubes. Like, half a teaspoon minimal. One of the comments made by police was that Debbie had most likely suffered from Immersion Syndrome. For those who are unaware, Immersion Syndrome, also known as Trench Foot, is an injury caused by the cold and prolonged exposure to damp and cold temperatures. The extremities, arms and legs become cold, numb, pale, etc., and then become covered in blisters. However, the autopsy had zero indication of anything involving Immersion Syndrome, and she was completely covered which makes this highly unlikely. 
Supposedly, the police hadn't taken the body on the day it was found. The diver for the police went into the water, claimed he saw the body in the barrel, and the next day they were supposed to be draining the pond to get the body. To add on to that, please do remember that barrel does not officially exist. However, when everyone returned the next day to drain said pond and get the body, the barrel was gone. The body was found lying on the bottom of the pond, and that was the end of it. From here, the police continued to deny that they ever saw a barrel. The clothing situation gets a little more in-depth than the information that I have already stated. Her pants were brown corduroys that were much too large and were undone. Mind you, this was a nurse that was supposed to be going to work in the morning. Why would she be wearing brown corduroys? The bra was much larger than initially claimed. Debbie officially wore a 34B, and the bra that the police claimed was hers was a 38C. The shoes that she was wearing weren't just too big, they were also men's shoes and a size 6, when Debbie wore a size 7 in women's. The jacket that she was wearing was also a regulation field army jacket, a jacket that made no sense to be found on her body, it wasn't hers, and there were no names on it to identify whose it was. Things continued to get stranger as time went on. A friend of Debbie's had gone over to her cabin to take care of her dogs after all was said and done, and randomly found Debbie's wool cap in the mud on the opposite end of the pond from where Debbie had entered. The pond had a thin layer of ice on it, so it was highly unlikely that it simply floated to the top of the pond or over to the other side. After the investigation, the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations returned the clothing to Debbie's mother. The shoes that were returned were spotless, yet the investigators claimed that they had not cleaned them. Lastly, on December 27th of 1985, the day after she went missing, Debbie's stepfather found a white short sleeve nurse's uniform on the kitchen floor. This was mentioned earlier. This nurse's uniform, however, was not the one that Debbie had been wearing, as confirmed by a co-worker that had been having coffee with her on the 26th. He claimed that he had spilled coffee on her sleeve, and that it was definitely a long sleeve shirt that she was wearing. The last bit of information that I would like to cover here is the voicemail. Here is the audio clip of the voicemail that was left. Please note that this voicemail is from 1985, and the quality isn't the best. Hey Deb, Miss Sharer birthday. Uh, I just wondering how you doing. Uh, if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at eight two two seven zero zero seven, or I'll give you a call at home tonight. Uh, you've been having a lot of days. You made me worry when you miss another one. I just want to make sure you're okay. Bye. The man in that voicemail was stating that Debbie had not been to work in several days, which was incorrect. By the time the family had listened to the voicemail, Debbie had only been absent for a few hours at most. The investigators actually claimed that they had interviewed this man and several patients that had mental problems from the hospital, where Debbie worked. Interestingly enough, the man that left the voicemail then left the state immediately after being interviewed on this case. This is a really strange case, and I can only think of two scenarios that could have occurred. First off, there is the possibility that she had drowned in the pond. This is the most quote-unquote official theory, but it's also incredibly unlikely. Debbie was an active person, more than capable of getting out of a pond if she fell in. On top of that, the area where she had supposedly entered the pond was the shallow side. Then there's the claim that the divers stated her body was found in a barrel. It was stated by Jenny's divers that the body was in the barrel. Then the police diver also said the body was in a barrel. However, when the pond was drained the day after, there were no barrels to be found. This led Jenny to believe that the barrel had been taken overnight to remove evidence of murder. 
Lastly, one scenario where she was alive when she entered the pond would be if she intended to take her own life. This isn't likely, and there is zero indication that she would do so. There were no indications of mental health issues, and she seemed to be a very happy person. So again, this isn't likely, but is technically possible. Then there's the likely but not officially accepted theory. She was murdered and dumped in the pond. If there was, in fact, a barrel, and her body was, in fact, placed in said barrel, then this is a 100% certainty. However, since the barrel was seemingly missing when they drained the pond, I have to only say it's a possibility. If this is the case, and from this, the overall question has to become, who killed Debbie Wolf? The most likely suspect is the man that left the voicemail, but he disappeared and the police never charged him or stated that he was actually a suspect. Unfortunately, and I don't want to cut this section short, but that's kind of it. There were no real suspects ever named in this case. The official police claim is that she died of drowning. Everyone else says she was murdered. The only suspicious person left pretty much as soon as the investigation looked away from him, and there was no one else that was seemingly involved with Debbie or this situation. Disclaimer, this is my opinion, solely my opinion, and my opinion only. It is not your opinion, it is not necessarily a popular opinion, nor an unpopular opinion. It is solely the opinion of me, as the Raven dreams. My take on this case, first and foremost, she did not die of drowning. There's way too much evidence to point at the probability that she was murdered and put in the water. The fact that there was no water in her airways or bronchioles is more than enough to tell me that she did not drown. There have been a number of investigations into fire-related deaths, where murder was declared as the cause of death because there was in fact no smoke in the lungs. So, why would they claim she drowned when she hadn't taken in water? The fact that they do this and state this as the official cause of death is insane to me. The missing barrel tells me that the person involved knew there was an investigation going on and potentially knew that the pond was going to be drained when it was. Either that, or they had damn good timing. Regardless, the fact that Jenny's divers saw a barrel and the police divers saw a barrel, but then it was miraculously gone, is very, very suspicious to me. I'm sorry, but to claim that people were seeing her coat wrapped around her head and thinking it was an old oil drum just really that's really what they're going to go with i would say that the man that left the voicemail is most likely the top suspect though to be honest i can't say much to that as there is no information on who he was he was interviewed claimed that he had an alibi denied a polygraph test let go, and then he immediately fled the state. If that doesn't scream suspicious, then there is nothing beyond a confession that these police would ever take as something suspicious in this case. The fact that they let him go and, and no information about why he left the voicemail was taken is terrible, and to put it simply, it was incompetent. I've covered incompetent police on this series before, and honestly, this falls right in line with the previous case. I'm sorry, but it does. To me, that voicemail feels like somebody was trying to cover their own tracks. Like, if he thought he left a voicemail saying that she hadn't been to work for several days, maybe they would think she was missing longer than she had been. Basically, he was trying to shift the timeline, but didn't account for the fact that she had spent Christmas with her family. Unfortunately, and as is the pattern here on Raven Investigates, we will never have answers unless somebody comes forward and confesses to this crime. This case is no longer considered open. 
the official cause of death is drowning. There have been private investigators that have been given information on the case and asked to draw a conclusion, but those conclusions are pretty much always that there's not enough evidence to determine what happened. Since that tragic day in 1985, almost 35 years ago, John and Jenny have both passed away. On top of that, her two siblings, John and Joseph, have also passed away. At this point, there's nobody that's actively looking into this investigation. And the saddening truth is, we will likely never know what happened. I do personally commend the Godwin Consultancy Firm for their write-up, and I wanted to say that they have once again done an amazing job of combing through the information as best as they can, and maybe they'll find more information and come to an actual conclusion on this case. That said, what do you all think of this case? Do you think this was an accidental drowning? Do you think she was murdered and placed in the water after the fact? What do you think about the investigator's investigation into the situation? Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below, and I will see you all on the next Raven Investigates. Until then, this is Raven, signing off. Sleep well.